But today, uh, he's going to bring the word, Daniel uh, Young from, from Chi Alpha. And this is his wife, Jessica. Uh, I'm sure he was probably going to introduce her. And I just stole this thunder. Sorry about that, Daniel. <laughs> But, but they, they're with us, and they do Chi Alpha ministry here at, at, at the campus, and they've been a blessing to us, and, and he's going to get in, and I'm sure he'll, he'll share some things about that, but, but we, I know that they're missionaries, but we consider them family, and, and they're, they're brothers, they're sisters to us, and, and we, we just love them, and, and thank God that we have the opportunity, and have had the opportunity to, to be able to host them and to, to, to have them come. And, and, and so today he's going to share his heart. And I know that he has a word from God. And I pray that, that you are ready to receive that seed that is coming. Would you come? And would you just give God the praise this morning? Please pray. Pastor, God bless you. God bless all of you. It is an honor. It's a wonderful honor to be here. Thank you. Uh, my wife has a beautiful voice. Don't you think? Beautiful voice. I happen to be biased, but I've been playing music long enough to know that um, her voice is the best in the universe, and everyone else is wrong. So. No, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's just a privilege and an honor to be here again. My, my name is Daniel Young. Um, I grew up in a place called Tomball, Texas, northwest Houston area. And if you just, if you get confused, Pastor Daniel, uh, just between names, and I, you can just call, just think of it in spiritual terms, you can just call me Daniel the Lesser. That's Daniel the Greater. His holiness is, is far off the charts, and I submit humbly underneath um, as uh, second place. So if you just get confused, um, and, and need, which name are you talking about? I'm Daniel the Lesser. Uh, so uh, today we're going to be in John chapter 7. In John chapter 7, and we're going to start in verse 37. Chapter 7, verse 37. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you so much for just giving us the privilege of, of being brothers, as you said. Um, Pastor, I have been able, I've just been blessed, absolutely blessed to be able to spend some time with him throughout the past year, year and a half. And he really has discipled me. He has poured into me every single minute we're together. I love Pastor because he never wastes time with conversation. Do you ever have friends like that? They just talk about nothing. And you just, you're like, you're, they're not talking about anything meaningful. You know, I'm sorry if this hurts some of you. I'm not a sports fan, so it's easy for me to stab at sports. But you just, they talk about sports all day long, and I just get bored very quickly. But when I hang out with a pastor, he is always intentional with conversation. He always wants to talk about Jesus. And there's just nothing better. To, there's, there's nothing, there's no better way to spend your time than learning and sharing with one another what God is speaking. And I appreciate it very much, um, just your discipleship to me. Um, but in John chapter 7, Jesus is with his disciples, and I want to go through um, these words that he says, starting in verse 37. Let's stand for the reading of the Word of God. It says, On the last day, that great day, of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, Truly, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Will the Christ come out of Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem, where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Yeah. Then the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees 
who said to them, Why have you not brought him in? And the officers answered this incredible sentence. No man ever spoke like this man. Let's pray. Jesus, we ask you, Holy Spirit, to minister to our hearts this morning. Speak to us, Father, about the incredible truth of your personality and your character. Teach us your words this morning. Open our ears to receive this. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. You know, I've always wondered, have you ever thought about what would you do if you lived in the time where Jesus walked this earth? What, what kind of person would you be and how, particularly how interested would you be in his ministry? If you saw Jesus walking along and the crowds were following him, and as you observed, you saw more and more attention was put on him, what, what would your response be? I've, all, I've thought about that. Now, initially, we would think, oh, I would run up to him, I would grab the hem of his garment, I would say, Jesus, but think about it. This is, no one knew who Jesus was. No one really understood. In fact, nobody understood what he was doing and why he was there. In fact, his best friends, when Jesus was arrested, abandoned him. So I think about that. What would I do? What would we do if we saw him never have heard him of Christ walking on this earth, never have seen him before? You would have heard the prophecy spoken in the past. But would you have the courage to have gone up to him and to approach him? And I, t and I think about my own life, and back in a time, um, I could probably have a good guess of the type of person I would be and the type of response I would have. I dress even. You could have your life put on the line. You could have all of your reputation, everything lost. If you do something so scary and dangerous as run up to him and say, Jesus, heal me. Heal my child. My child is sick. Do you follow me? What would we have done? And I remember um, very young, one of my first youth pastors, it was a very, very difficult time in my life. If, you, if anyone here can relate to this, I think you can understand that we go through these cycles, especially as young men and women, where we reach out to God and we seek after Him and then we kind of do go into this slump where we're depressed. We Maybe it's a struggle with some kind of sin. And your life seems like this circular, repeated pattern. Everything is great. I would describe it this way. I would go to church camp and you get on the spiritual high. That's how we describe it. The spiritual, like it, all of this excitement and joy. And then you come home from church camp and you just, you just tank. You just go right down and you're depressed again. And you say things like this. God, why can't I? serve you the way I want to. Anyone ever feel like that? Lord, why can't I serve you and love you the way I know I should in my head? What is the deal? And I remember a very difficult time where I felt like the entire world was giving up on me and that I had absolutely no chance in this world to live a godly life. And think about it. This is a time in the world where, you, where a young child will look up at adults Look up at parents, and there's not that much godly influence going around. So what can a young child do when all of the adults, when all of the parents and people that they see are not walking with Jesus? I remember looking, and I would go to, I've been to tons of churches as a child, and I would say, Lord, help me. How am I supposed to grow into an adult and still love you? And still walk with you. Some of you may have gone through this as well. But I remember the straw that broke the camel's back. I was desperate for a word from God. I was desperate for help and for something. And typically as young people, you put all of your hope on your youth pastor. Sorry, Daniel, but it's kind of true. <laughs> you put all of your hope. If, if Daniel, if my youth pastor, if my adult pastor can walk with Jesus so much for me to where it will actually force me to walk with God and all of these habits I will finally be able to leave. Do you follow me when I'm saying this? 
that you just, we rely on the people we look up to. Now, this is what was absolutely unexpected. I, I just graduated into the ninth grade. One of the first Wednesday night services my church held, my youth pastor got in front of everyone and said, I'm leaving the church. And as a young man, hearing those words from someone you were counting on more than anything else to help you walk with God, it is a moment where you say, Lord, not only have you given up on me, but my youth pastor, my parents, there surely is no hope for me. But as time went on, I found out the beauty of the darkness. See, when the Lord took the youth pastor away, now this was a terrible thing, and youth pastors typically get recycled around like crazy in the church today, but the Lord used this, and he basically taught me, you do not need another man in which to know me. You just come to me. You approach me yourself, and you see the church today tends to worship Jesus from a distance. We tend to have this relationship with God where we are standing in the crowd among all the people. We're looking at Him. We're studying Him. We're investigating Him to see if He's good enough. To see if He is the person that we might be able to give our lives to. And we're in the crowd. But we're at a distance. We're far away. And we base our relationship and our motive to get to know Christ based on what other men say and based on what the world thinks of him. Could you imagine where your relationship with Jesus would be today if it was based off what our current world said? It would be a disaster. An utter disaster, right? You must approach Christ face to face. We worship him from a distance. We check to see what is going on, and we make sure the waters are safe before we can step out. Let me tell you this. You will never know Christ looking from afar. You will never know Jesus standing in the crowds, watching and waiting. You have to approach him. You have to get in his face. You have to approach in, in clear, clear path, pass by everybody. You have to get right in front of him and say, Jesus, Lord, I need you. You see, if we think about Jesus once a week when we come to church, you probably only know Jesus looking from afar. Right? If your time with Jesus is equivalent to your time spent in church, I would suggest to you that you probably only know Jesus looking from afar. Not up close as the friend he was meant to be. Not face to face. You see, Jesus offers us a relationship that is closer than any brother. The most intimate friendship that you could possibly imagine. Dr. Leslie Weatherhead says this in his book, The Transforming Friendship. There is no greater need in our time than that those who teach religion should concern themselves, not with tightening up the machinery, developing organization, or arranging more meetings, but rather to make Jesus real to men, to invite them into that transforming fellowship, which cannot be proved safe by personal experience. Do you follow me? There's nothing wrong with the organization. There's nothing wrong with the structure and the, and the rituals. We have these things in order to bring us to Jesus. But you follow me when I say, if you come to church based on just a habit and not to get in the face of Jesus and see him and know him, the church is just a ritual no different from vacuuming a carpet. Right? Dr. Weatherhead continues in answering, uh, in answering this. He says, I think you have to begin where the disciples began, with a daily friendship into which they entered very quietly and humbly until the more august truths became true for them. If you begin at the wrong place, because people tell you you have to believe and repeat and say all these things, you will have a figment of imagination, a ghost instead of a friend. Do we worship Jesus from a distance? Or are we straight near him, next to him, in face to face? In the passage, we see Jesus speaking with an unparalleled authority. I noticed something fascinating about the words of Jesus when we read through the scriptures. Jesus never spoke 
apologetically. Think about this. Jesus never once spoke the words, it is natural therefore to suppose. He never says the words, it may probably be this. He never says, consult the authorities on this. When Jesus speaks, it pierces straight into your heart like a sword. And he doesn't apologize for it. And he doesn't second guess. He, this man is the, mo it's the most staggering words you will ever read off of a page. The words of Christ. It's so interesting to me when Jesus walks up to people and he says, come follow me. Or he walks up to fishermen and says, throw your nets into the water. He starts ordering people around as if he's God or something. Yeah. He just says it. He just says it like it is. In John 6, 63, he says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Listen, that the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life itself. The words of Jesus like the very breath in your lungs. And in John 7, 38, the scripture we just read, he says these words, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What? Yeah. Rivers of living water. Him speaking about the coming of the Holy Spirit on men in the filling of baptism of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And very quickly in Luke chapter 21, he says these words, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will never pass away. My words will never pass away. Evidently, Jesus' words are more firm than gravity itself. The words of Christ right in front of our eyes, like the very breath in our lungs, like the very gravity that keeps us from flying off this rock. Jesus' words will be the thing that keeps you moving every single day. The words of Christ, the Son of the Lord God. Jesus had absolute mastery over his tongue. Who else could say that about themselves? He has absolute mastery over his tongue. Now, this is staggering to me. Forget, just put all of the miracles Jesus did. That, that, those things are obvious. All of the miracles, all of the laying hands on the sick, the miraculous things that happened everywhere he went, Think about this. He had complete mastery over his tongue. What a miraculous sign is that? How staggering to know that a man lived for 33 years and never misspoke. What? And never said anything remotely selfish, sinful, or unworthy of conversation. Jesus is the type of man that you can walk up to and you know that you'll never be bored. Because everything he says is like breath. It's going to fill you. Isn't that amazing? Praise the Lord. As soon as, as soon as we open our mouths to say something, this is what happens to us. As soon as we open our mouths, you always unintentionally, no matter what, reveal something about yourself. Have you ever said something and realized that it said a little bit more than you were anticipating? I call it the face palm slap moment. You're just like, oh, goodness. I said something and now everyone thinks I'm dumb. So we, we pick on our students often because we, we, as a joke, will take things to the extreme. And a student like Julio or Edward will, will just in casual conversation will say, yeah, I was talking to this girl on campus and she was telling about this ministry and all of us, all the guys in the room go, oh, what's her name? Did you get her number? And we always pick up like, no, stop, stop. We just had a conversation. Leave me alone, and we mess with them because, you know, it's funny. <laughs> but we always take it to the extreme. Like, if someone will get a text. We'll be sitting in the living room. Someone will be the phone will go, and we'll go, oh, what's your name? What's your name? Who are you dating now? And they're like, no, stop. And it's like their mom or something. But on a serious note, uh, we say things that tend to reveal more. It reveals more because when you speak words, you're not only speaking words, but you're speaking your motives and your intentions. You're speaking the why you do the things you do. And you're speaking the 
who do you do those who do you do them for why do you do the things you do and who do you do them for I hear these words especially growing up in the church I've heard these words so often I'm just not getting anything out of worship anymore have you ever heard that I'm just not getting anything out of worship anymore I'm just not really getting anything out of the preaching or maybe out of the small group that I'm involved in. Have you ever heard these words? And it always reveals a little bit more than you think. When a person says, I'm just not getting anything out of church, just not getting anything out of the preaching, most of the time what it means is this, I do not have a sufficient devotional life. Our pastor's job, listen to these words, our pastor's job is not to feed empty stomachs, but to water what you have already planted there throughout the week. Do you follow me? His pastor's ministering and preaching is not to take the place of your devotional life with God. It's to plant deserts. His job is to water and plant the seeds that the Holy Spirit has already planted in your heart. Amen. Some of us ask Him to do way too much. Way too much. Because we don't get with God. Right? We don't get with God throughout the week. And we say these things, I'm just not getting anything out of the service anymore. 99.% of the time, it is a confession that I'm not walking with Jesus alone. If you are walking with God alone, and I'm certainly not speaking about our pastor here, but you go to the internet or go to YouTube or go on TV, you hear some boring sermons, don't you? You hear some pretty boring sermons. I, I mean, I've heard thousands of sermons, and some of them you, there, some of them can be very easy to fall asleep to. I mean, if someone's bad at preaching, of course, you'll fall asleep. Hopefully no one's going to be falling asleep like this, but uh, we have these, we listen to these sermons, but think about it. If your heart is in the Word of God and you're feeding your soul, the simplest of messages will make you alive. They will waken up your heart and, and someone will just say, Jesus loves you. Something that you may have heard a thousand times, but it's going to make you weep because you are in His face. You're not worshiping Jesus from a distance. Have you heard these words before? I can't uh, go back to church. This person hurt me too bad. Have you ever seen this? I just, I can't handle the, this, that church over there. I can't deal with it. Those, those people are doing this. Those people are doing that. How could they? How could they hurt me and do such a terrible thing to me? Let me tell you this. You never leave the church because somebody hurts you. You leave the church because you were unable to forgive somebody who hurts you. Do you follow me? You do not leave the church because someone hurts you. You leave because you are unable to forgive those. Church is a place where we get to learn how to love our neighbor that we might not have been so excited to see that day because forgiveness. Right? Amen? Amen. We come to church to be reminded and to see what forgiveness really looks like, particularly in the life of Christ. Jesus' words irrevocably bring you in. They pull you from the crowd and they bring you face to face and he deals with you right where you are. Jesus' words reveal some incredible things about his character and his motive. And there's four points that I would like to make about this, about his words revealing his character and his motive. You see, he speaks a lot of things, but the, the miraculous and the majesty of Christ's words is that they reveal the heart of the Father. They reveal who He is. And we're going to get into this, these four things. Firstly, they reveal His inward motive. His words reveal His inward motive. Jesus is the only man in existence who is not for Himself, who did not live every single moment a selfish moment. He lived completely for the glorification and the honor of the Father, and completely to redeem mankind. His very existence was about you and me. We see the amazing miracles that Jesus did, but look at the marvel of his character. Jesus says in John chapter 8, I'll say it just very quickly, he says this, 
Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? That's a staggering comment. Can, he stands in front of a crowd. Imagine this. He says, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Is what he says. Could you imagine me preaching on campus or anyone and then standing up and saying, can any of you prove me guilty of sin? And someone said to us, uh, Daniel, I, I saw you say that word a few hours ago. You just lost your temper. I mean, how embarrassing would it have been it, if you, or someone stands up and a man on our stands up and says, can any of you prove me guilty in the humiliation of the truth that they are in fact guilty about many things, right? Jesus actually could say that. He stood up and said, can any of you prove me guilty? And no one says a word. Even the men that walked with him every single day, thinking back, and there, you could just imagine them thinking back, well, there's yesterday, there's the week before, and then no. Jesus, and they're looking and thinking, his life, his very words were perfect. The man who had mastery over his tongue. So, this question we ask for our college students every single year. This question that is the motive. The, the revelation of Christ and his motive. Why do I do the things I do and who do I do them for? If any man asks himself this question, just six minutes into the conversation you are deep into religion, you are deep into what it means to be human and what it means to walk with God. This is the ultimate revealer of personality and character. Why do I do the things I do, and who do I do them for? This question will tell you everything you need to know about yourself. Is our lives, the meaning, and this is what we ask our students, is the meaning of your life simply just to go to work every single day, come to church every Sunday, be a part of a few events and then go home and then go back to work, go on vacation maybe once a year. Is that really all there is? We ask our students, why are you here going to college? Why are you here as students? What is your calling? What does it mean? Is it really just to get a job? You go through all of the suffering and pain of going through class, of paying tuition, all of these horrible nightmares the students have. And... <coughs> But what is it for? What is it for? Is the meaning, is God's purpose and plan for your life just to go to work and then go to church and then go back to work? Or does he have an absolute plan and calling for your life? Well, we believe, guys, the scripture that tells us and teaches us what God has done in you, he will do through you. God is not interested in an audience. He's asking for an army. He is not interested in an audience that's just going to sit here on our Sunday mornings and fold our hands and, and have our hair nicely combed, even though everyone here looks lovely. But goodness, we go through this, the patterns. We go through the rituals. But Jesus has called us to be fighters. He has called us to be missionaries. For the kingdom of God. Amen? Yes. What God has done in you, He wants to do through you. What is Jesus' motive when He is walking this earth but for you and Him to be friends again? Not just so you can sit in church, sing a few songs, go about your week like every single other week, but to assist Him into making disciples of every nation. Heaven forbid our lives look like boring Christian lives. You see, if we are living for Jesus, or if any of us here, including myself, think that in any moment walking with Jesus is boring, then we're most likely worshiping Him from afar. We're seeing Him in a distance. You're not face to face. If we, and I tell our students this too, if our walk with Jesus is boring, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Basically. It's exciting. Ask any of our students about the trip to Chile. It was terrifying and incredibly exciting all at the same time, but you'll have to ask them. Number two, it reveals his personal prerogative. Jesus' words reveal his personal prerogative. His words indisputably brings 
men to the Father. Jesus' mission was to clear the gap between man and God and clear the separation through his sufferings on the cross. Jesus' goal is to, is to clear the separation and bring men to the Father. Turn with me to John chapter 12. It's just a few pages over. Chapter 12, starting in verse 44. His personal prerogative. Jesus says this, or the scripture says this, When Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Verse 45. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world. And whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Thank God he says these words. I have not come into the world to judge, but to save the world. Reminds me of the scripture, those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. He who rejects me, listen to this. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The words that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Scary scripture for the heart for us this morning. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command. And what, what should say, and what I should say, and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Jesus, in a miraculous, fascinating way, merely is repeating the heart and the intentions of the Father. One of my favorite missionaries, Dr. E. Stanley Jones, a missionary to India, said this phrase. He says, the most amazing news in life was finding out that God was in fact like Jesus. The most amazing news in life was finding out that God the Father is in fact exactly like Jesus. The man that walks, the man out of Galilee, the man from Bethlehem, Christ the Nazarene, is walking God the Father, walking in the flesh. The deity of Christ is inescapable. He gives you no room to define him as you please. He says, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, I meet many atheists on the university. And I remember some time ago, many years ago, there was an atheist that I was very good friends with. We had many, many conversations, many difficult conversations. This guy was actually much smarter than me, so he put me to shame quite a bit and embarrassed me, and, and I'm, I'm not the quickest of, of thinkers. So I'm, I'm kind of a slow person. And so if it's not scripted out, you'll hear me, um, um, you'll just, it'll be all day. But I'm speaking with this young atheist, and he's much smarter than me, and, and I'm getting really frustrated because I'm, I'm like trying to explain something to him, and he just keeps shutting me down, right? So um, a few years later, after hours and hours and hours of studying, of listening to Ravi Zacharias and the reading books, and apologetics and just the scripture just filling my life with learning about um, just C.S. Lewis, all of these wonderful authors that bring us closer to Jesus. I was having a conversation with him and, and he said these words that amazed me. He said, you know, I've been reading Matthew and, and I, you know, which is very common for atheists to memorize lots of scripture so they can stump you, so you gotta be ready. Um, but he's reading Matthew, and he's like, I really love and I really enjoy um, reading Matthew because I like listening about the law. Ironically, this is a person who previously said, I'm very proud of the way I live my life and, and basically how I fail all of my classes and don't care about it. He lives as though is there no law, but then finds it fascinating to read the law and the scriptures. And so he is speaking, and he's, and he's talking, and he's like, and he says these words, and this is when the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He says, I really admire Jesus. I really think highly of him as a great teacher. And it clicked. I said, stop right there. I said, Jesus gives you no room, absolutely no room to call him a good teacher. 
Jesus gives you no wiggle room to call him just merely a prophet or a good teacher. This is a man that says, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Think about that. If some person, or even me, comes up here and says, personally, everyone here, I, Daniel, everyone on the side of truth listens to Daniel. You would laugh at me, as you should, right? Jesus said these words, and everyone was terrified because they're, they're thinking, this might be true. We haven't seen the guy sin, right? He says, I and the Father are one. Jesus' words are so unique, so staggering, that he says, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. As C.S. Lewis says, let's not make the horrible, monstrous mistake to call him a good teacher. You've only, Jesus gives you at best three options. He is either a demon-possessed man, a monster, something horrible out of the pits of hell, or the most genius liar and con man we have ever seen in our lives who is willing to go to death for a lie, or we kneel down and call him Lord, the man who he really is. And I said, you cannot be satisfied. You, he gives you no room to call him a good teacher, you have to go farther than that. No man on earth will call a man who says, I and the Father are one, just a good teacher. He's either crazy or he's right. What do you think? Who do you think Jesus is? And that's what I asked him. He was like, well, okay. But Jesus gives us no room to call him just merely a teacher. He is either the Lord of heaven and earth or something worse or something Horrible. If Jesus is just a person of the past to us, if he's just a man that we quote because the words of Jesus are wonderful and you, you can use them throughout your week, and if he's just a ghost that we refer to, that we talk about in conversation, and then when we get to church we worship him, and if you admire him, just the things that he did, the, the wonderfully positive things that Jesus did, then still we don't get it. We're worshiping him from afar. We don't know the true Christ. The true Christ who is the actual representation of the Father. Thirdly, his unrivaled distinction. I'm going to go through this quickly. His unrivaled distinction. In the humanness of Jesus, pay attention very close to this. Jesus' is human nature. He is a man that is unlike any man who has ever lived. Think of this scripture that we just read. They said, no one has ever spoken like this man. Guys, this is fascinating. These men walk up to arrest Jesus on the spot in front of everyone. They approach him and hear his words. They stop dead in their tracks and they change their minds and they go back to the officials and the Pharisees, and they said, why didn't you bring him in? They said, no one spoke. No one on earth has spoken like this man. Could you imagine seeing that? Could you imagine a police officer going up to arrest a wanted criminal, right? And walking up to him and just hearing a criminal preach, then stop and say, you know what? I'm not going to lay a finger on this man. He is innocent. And in fact, I would rather lose my job I would rather lose everything, my reputation and my job, but because Christ is innocent. And they go back home and said that simply no one has ever spoken like this man. I want to read a poem or a quote titled One Solitary Life by Dr. James Allen Francis. He says this concerning Jesus. He was born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30 when public opinion turned against him. He never wrote a book. He never held office. He never went to college. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place where he was born. He did none of the things usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. 
He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While dying, his executioners gambled for his clothes, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, he says. And today, Jesus is a central figure of the human race and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the par par excuse me, parliaments that have ever been sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. You see, in the eyes of man, Jesus was an absolute failure. But in the kingdom of God, he is everything. He has done everything. Behold, I have overcome the world. So why would we listen to what the world says or what the world thinks? Does Jesus' words, does his very life, his humanness, his very human nature move you in a way? Or do we keep listening to the sounds the world makes? The sound of the world, the crowd that watches him from a distance. So let's recap. The firstly, we have his inward motive. Secondly, his personal prerogative. Thirdly, his unrivaled distinction. And fourthly and lastly, his simplistic beckoning. His words reveal Christ's simplistic beckoning. No scripture, I think, cries out to the everyday man greater than these words right here in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Could you imagine how horrible it would be if the Son of the Living God said anything else? Any other type of motive, any other type of truth, the truth that Jesus brings is that His yoke is easy. Following Him is, in fact, easy. Now, I know what you're thinking. There's nothing easy about life. There is nothing easy about the world we live in. But when Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light, think about it. Do you ever have a friend who's just difficult to get along with? <laughs> who are constantly talking about themselves, constantly bringing up their problems? Now what's marvelous about all of you here is that since you love God, you're basically a punching bag for the world. The world needs people like you that can take a punch. Because you know that Jesus will speak from you and when people bring their problems on you, you are the ones who have the answer for them. The Lord will use you in an incredible way. But think about how easy of a friend it is to be a friend of Jesus. Think about it. My yoke is easy. He is literally the easiest friend to have in the universe. He never thinks about himself. He never brings up his problems to you. He never bickers. He never says those, those, uh, those subconscious stabs, right? Whenever you do something and someone finds it annoying. They have that uh, passive-aggressive comment. Jesus, imagine, he's the friend that never does those things. And in fact, when you have those passive-aggressive comments, when we have those days where we're just having a horrible, horrible day and everything seems to be going wrong, Jesus is the friend that comes up to you and says, I know what it's like. I know where you're coming from. He is the only man who really identifies with you and I on this world, in this world. On this earth, he is the only man who really can identify with you in your pain. The calling of the disciple Matthew is almost hysterical. The scripture gives us no extra details. Jesus walks up to him sitting in his office. He says, follow me and nothing else. I imagine some conversation happened later on. But the scripture says that Jesus walks up, says, follow me. And Matthew at once arose and followed him. Just in a moment, he says, follow me. He gets up. Jesus did not say, please sign this waiver before you join my team. Jesus did not say, here, please fill out a membership card. No, I'm not 
smashing membership cards. Some of you we really want to get to know, and that's the only way we get to know you. But he, Jesus does not hand out these things, right? He says, he does not go up to Matthew and say, let me check you on your doctrine first. He says, follow me. You see, so many times we get in the trap of trying to get everything right. Now, please don't mishear me. We have to have correct doctrine. We have to be preaching the actual word of God and nothing else. Those things I am not taking away from. But the first step we take, Jesus just says, follow me. Jesus just says, come and follow me. We say this often sometimes. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. We say this often sometimes. We say this, this phrase, no one really initially gets saved for the right reasons. And this is what I mean. Whenever I first gave my life to Jesus, it's because I saw a scary show on TV of a person getting demon-possessed. So I didn't want to be demon-possessed. So I went up to my mom and dad, oh, is this going to happen to me? Help me. And they said, no, if you have Jesus in your life, I want Jesus in my life. And when I was eight years old, bam. No more demon possession for Daniel. And you hear all these, you hear about, we'll, we'll hear a story later on, a person goes to church just because they went because a girl a girl invited them. They thought, the guy thought the girl was cute, so he went to church. Now, but then they get saved, right? We don't normally get saved initially for the right reasons, but it's a great start. You don't, be, you don't immediately, boom, you're perfect. As soon as you step into Christianity, you walk with him. He says, follow me. I'm going to train you. I'm going to grow you. I'm going to teach you. We get this idea, we say, imitate Christ. How on earth, if you're a scumbag, do you all of a sudden, boom, become not a scumbag? It takes some time. Now, I'm not discounting what the Holy Spirit can do. Because I've seen alcoholics fall on their face and then boom, they're no longer al alcoholics. Amen? The Lord knows how to break rules. And he does it better than anybody, I think. Right? But Jesus says, follow me. You don't have to have every single thing in place when you start. Those things will happen. I want friendship first. Friendship with God. Friendship with Christ first. Then the doctrine. Then everything comes later. Jesus' personality was absolutely magnetic. These people that come up to him are drawn to him unlike any other man. The theologian Albert Schweitzer has this statement. He says this in his The Quest of the Historical Jesus. He comes to us as one unknown, without a name, as of old. By the lake side he came to those who knew him not. He speaks to us the same word, follow thou me, and sets us to the task which he has to fulfill for our time. He commands, and to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings which they shall pass through in his fellowship, and as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their experience who he is. Jesus with us in the toils. Have you ever suffered? Here's a question. Have you ever suffered with Jesus? Have you ever knelt down and thought about the lost world? About the people losing their lives? Horribly executed and murdered just because they say, I love the Lord, I love Jesus. Have you ever suffered with Christ before? Have you ever been downcast just because of the what you know when I see people who are happy every single day and they never have a bad day I don't trust those people because it's just not realistic now I don't meet people that have a good attitude all the time that's I think that's possible if you walk with Jesus he'll give you a good attitude and he'll help you but if you never have a bad day ever you're lying to me <laughs> right right if you walk with Jesus friends you and I are going to suffer. I was just thinking just the other day about the students on campus and I began to weep because of the things they are being taught, the things that they are being told, the things that they go through, and the future of, the, of our generation, it's, it's quite it's scary. 
it's quite scary. But I see what they go through. I see the broken families. I see the pain and the hurt. And I realize if I'm going to get close to Jesus, I have to be willing to shed tears. If you never cry, if you never be broke, if you've never been brokenhearted for the things of God or for His people, it might be that you're worshiping Him at a distance and you've never really gotten close enough to see His heart. Jessica, you can come back. I want to close with this. Jesus doesn't ask people, try to be as good as you can from here on out. He just says, follow me. Follow me. Don't start trying to be good. I feel like we have so many issues and so much, we, we have all of these try harder motivational speeches. Just try harder when God just says, in, in fact, he says, believe differently. Believe that he is here, he is your friend, and he is here for you. You see, our inward motive, Jesus' inward motive is to turn you into a soldier. He is not interested in an army. His words have revealed his personal prerogative, his invitation to friendship. Jesus is not interested in someone who just hangs out with him every once in a while. That's, and everyone here knows that's not a real friend. Jesus is interested in true, real friendship with you. What an amazing thing to be friends with God. Thirdly, his unrivaled distinction, his uniqueness makes him a friend like no other. You will never have a better friend than Jesus. You will never have so much joy than walking with Jesus. No one will ever treat you better. No one will ever help you more than walking with Jesus. And finally, his simplistic beckoning, he just says, come to me. Think about nothing else. Think about absolutely nothing else in come. Come to me. There is a magnificent story of a man by the name Charles Finney. And after the time of the Civil War, as the Civil War and Reconstruction was happening in America, there started to be a stir. And Charles Finney, a lawyer, an unsaved atheist lawyer, is reading his books and he is interested in getting to know God. And so what he does, he, this is a guy who a girl invited him to church because he thought she was cute. She sang in the choir and he was a brilliant at his occupation at practicing law. But the words of the pastor at his church stirred him. And so he got a Bible and he started to read. He started to read the scriptures and when his clients would walk into his study, he was embarrassed and he would throw his law textbooks on top of the Bible because he didn't want anyone to see that he was reading the Bible. If you're a lawyer and you're reading the Bible, especially in that time, you could get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> you could lose your job if you have to be honest, right? <laughs> so he's, he's uh, embarrassed because he's reading the scripture. He's, he's studying, he's learning about Jesus and he is just being pulled. The Holy Spirit pulling on his heart, pulling on his heart. And for weeks, he starts to hide from the people in his town. He goes into the woods and he starts praying. He starts seeking God. And he starts praying. That this Now again, this is before he's saved. He's not saved yet. He's not a Christian. But he's praying. He's saying, God, if I'm going to give my life to you, you're going to have to help me. I can't I can't do this. I know if I'm going to give my life to you. I know you're going to ask me to quit my job. And I just, I don't know if I'm ready for this. And in the woods, he wrestled with God for weeks before he actually got saved. Isn't that incredible? Spending time with Jesus, just digging and figuring out, God, what do you want in my life? Help me through this. That's the same way as Jacob wrestled with God. Charles Finney prayed and prayed and wrestled. And he speaks in his autobiography when he was in his room. He was, he, he was in the woods earlier and he says, Lord, today is the day, no matter what, I'm going to give you my life. And if I can't do it, I'll die. Today is the, my last day on this earth. 
help me, Holy Spirit, give my life over to you. Help me to let go of these things that's keeping me here on earth. Help me to let go. And in his room, he experiences the most mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he writes, his autobiographer almost didn't put this in the book because it was so controversial. But Charles Finney says this, he starts laughing, he starts weeping, and he just, boom, he just gets saved and he is uncontrollably weeping. And he says this, it felt as though I was being fanned by immense wings. Inside his room, his, it was a literal thing. The hair on his head was blowing in the wind or the breath of God. He says it didn't feel like it was I was being fanned by immense wings. Finney, for a time, was approaching, was watching Jesus from afar, watching him from a distance, watching how the world would respond, watching how is the world going to react to the Son of God. And the Holy Spirit brought him close, face to face, grabs the hem of his garment and says, Jesus, I need you or I'll die. Have we ever been there? Jesus, I need you or I'll die. I gotta have you. I need nothing else but you. You see, if we're, if you are here and God is speaking to you, are we here standing in the crowd looking at a distance? It's not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough watching what other people are going to do. You have to get in his face. You have to approach Christ. He is here. He is saying, come to me. Come to me and I will give you rest. We literally turn away joy every single day. We turn away joy when we turn away Christ. We turn away peace because of the things that in our lives that get in the way. We literally turn away peace and joy if we could just come to Him. If we could get in front of Him, grab the hem of His garment, and He says, who took my power away from me? Like the woman who grabbed us. I need you. She didn't even say a word. He didn't even say a word to her. She grabbed Him, and she was instantly healed by the Spirit of God. Are we standing at a distance? Or are we right in front of his face? As we bow our heads and close our eyes. If this is you, if God has spoken to you, he is saying, I want you. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden. Are you here and are you weary? Have you been beaten up, broken down by the world? Have you been hearing the messages of the world? And what they've been saying about Jesus, the horrible things that you can hear on the news, the people, your co-workers at work, the things they say about Jesus, how they don't give him reverence, they don't give him attention, they call him despicable things like just merely a good teacher. Or are you here and you're just hurting because you know there is more. You know there is more to know Jesus face to face. If you haven't approached him, if you haven't come near, He is here. He is here for you. He says, come to me. And if you just approach Him, you approach Him and you take away all of your fear, just, just right up at His feet and say, Jesus, these things in my life, I don't care anymore. I don't care what my friends say. I don't care what my coworkers may think. I need to be in your presence every single day. And every moment that we don't, we turn away joy. We turn away everlasting joy. That first step can be the hardest thing. It can be a humiliating thing to disrobe before the Lord and say, I am naked and unashamed. Take all of me. But I guarantee you every step afterwards will be easier. And the first step is always the hardest to take. But everyone after the Lord will help you. He'll give you strength if you come to me. Come to me. All you who are weary. We're going to open up these altars. We're going to have a time as Jessica sings and leads us. Come to me. All you who are weary. Come to Jesus. Say no to everything else. 
Let nothing back. Come to Jesus. Lay yourself at his feet and say, Lord, I'm tired of staring at you from a distance. I'm tired of wondering what the world says about you. Pass through the crowd, approach him face to face and say, Jesus, I'm yours. Jesus, make me a friend of God. Jesus, give me hope and peace. Let's seek him. Let's seek him out.